Hello everyone, today we talk about Marcus Aurelius youth, we can say up to a certain point actually since his birth to actually his 40th year of age that is essentially to the uh, accession to power as emperor, fundamentally so, also part of his mature uh, life. Um, Marcus Aurelius was born in Rome on April the 26th, 121. Mm -hmm. And um, his name at birth uh, was supposedly, because we don't know from, from the sources clearly. At this point, as we will see, um, you know, the, the imperial connections here, the, the succession, etc., didn't pass much through dynastic, rather to ad adoptional, clanterly connections, right? So um, these individuals rose, as we will see, from relative uh, modesty. To power, uh, we think he was um, uh, at birth. He was known as Marcus Annius Verus, mm -hmm. albeit some sources also assign this name to him upon his father's death, right, and unofficial adoption by his grandfather, as we will see upon his coming of age, or at the time of his marriage with uh, Antoninus' daughter, as we will see. Um, he might have been known as Marcus Annius Catilius Severus at birth, or at least at some point of his youth, or Marcus Catilius Severus Annius Verus, more completely. Um, so when um, he became Antoninus heir by a third adoption, he was known instead certainly as Marcus Aelius Aurelius Verus Caesar. Hmm? And upon his ascension, he was Marcus Aurelius Antoninus Augustus until his death, right? And um, other sources, for example, Epiphanius of Salamis in his chronology of Roman emperors on weights and measures calls uh, him Marcus Aurelius Verus. Um, the early life of Marcus Aurelius is very fascinating and also somewhat, you know, said but by by some standard as we will see as essentially a figure spent exclusively to me his uh you know work is starting for the accession to power he's a very unique figure at 18 this boy knew that he would become roman emperor right emperor of the universal empire um and uh he actually spent uh, m more than that the amount of that age to to prepare for it right and you know we remember properly Marcus Aurelius together with Augustus and uh, Claudius as properly an uh, emperor philosopher right and we have his beautiful uh, uh, works uh, we have the meditations we have the letters we have other uh, works of his that have left this remarkable, um, you know, voice from an exceptional individual indeed, given his role in the world uh, at the time, that also constitute, by the way, the last great uh, stoic work of the ancient world, which is not to be um, overlooked either in the history of philosophy. Maybe one day we will look at it better. So. Naturally, we will talk about this is the first time we talk about Marcus Aurelius directly, I mean, in a dedicated video, uh, and we will surely talk about him a lot uh, in the future. Just, you know, like Roman history videos here are more rare facted because we mostly dedicate to the Middle Ages, uh, to the Middle Ages. Um, however, just to give a, some introduction about the, the sources about Marcus Aurelius' life, well, even in here, is for, for most of Roman history, we don't have this dramatic amount of, of certainties, right? Um, given the, the caliber, let's say, of, of the individual. Uh, especially about his youth that we're going to discuss today. Um, the Storia Augusta, right, um, contains a lot of information about him, but this was basically written by a single author from the later 4th century. Right, and uh, uh, later biographies and, mm, say, biographies of subordinate emperors and usurpers are, in this work, not very uh, reliable. Let's say, um, the, mm, however, the early biographies, including the ones, in fact, about Marcus, actually came from 
uh, reliable sources might lost once, such as Marius Maximus or, in fact, Ignatus, um, that uh, tell us something more consistent. Um, in um, in general, for Marcus Aurelius' life, as for for Hadrian, for um, Antoninus Pius, uh, and the same Lucius Verus, we have a, a, a important you know reliability from these sources. Uh, while the ones about Aelius Verus, for example, or Avidius Cassius, are very fictional uh, in nature. Uh, we have also this extraordinary correspondence between Marcus Aurelius um, and his uh, tutor Fronto, right, and as well as with other various Antonine officials that have a focus on Marcus Aurelius uh, himself. Um, these derive from essentially a set of uh, manuscript sources, you know, f fragmentary enough uh, from dated from 138 to 160. In, uh, the same meditations offer a window on Marcus Herrera's life, uh, albeit they're not uh, dated and dateable, right? So they they also don't talk much about worldly affairs proper. So we, we can't track, we can't, yeah, say, look at the, uh, yeah, mostly with the mature men, we pr would presume, but not only, right? And gen like a general worldview that the emperor owned. Uh, then there is Cassius Dio, who was a uh, Hellenic senator from Bithynia Nicaea, who wrote a, hi a history of Rome um, uh, to, from its founding to the early 3rd century in 80 books. That is very important, at least for the, vil uh, for the military history of the period. Right? He owned some senatorial prejudices and um, in, um, also in opposition to imperial expansion. So uh, he... Um, you know, has an obscure vision of certain things and is not particularly objective. We have um, even Galen's work as a physician speaks of the habits of the Antonine elite. Uh, we have the orations of Aelius Aristides on the temper of his times. Right, this, this is the time of the second um, uh, sophistic. And uh, a moment, uh, this was the best time to be a Roman, Antonine Rome, right, specifically. It was this huge, um, you know, uh, hegemonic, you know, it deeply Hellenized empire at this point, especially reflecting the elites, right? So we will see how this was important for Marcus Aurelius, specifically that the local realities were, were more traditional, more conservative. And it's a beautiful, um, it's a broader uh, take on, on, on the universe and the world that here should, should be, we should go in, in detail and speaking about, especially... Marcus Aurelius' philosophical visions from Stoicism, but not only. But we will try to, to nucleate them now, and especially when we will talk about uh, Marcus Aurelius' reign proper. Right, He had a very uh, you know, philosophical take on life, and he fundamentally saw imperial task as a duty in a very philosophical way. It would be interesting to properly look at the differences existing from the, the earlier idea of properly the imperium as such that in fact uh, were still present at the time among for example when he still during his imperium uh, was taught by a phil philosopher that the, the, the Roman citizenry was kind of uh, kind of impressed because he said but this this is the imperium holder he is the imperator and he is taught by someone else this is a person who basically has received um, a Germany over the world from from the gods, and he should fundamentally go by their own uh, auspices, and uh, and he you know listened fundamentally to 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 some you know Hellenistic uh, theories. That 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 is already, if we want a mark of of those times, that especially in the elite, the same elite, of course, it was shocked that this was very much Hellenized in education, as we've seen. but at the same time. There was the substance of an empire was gradually uh, changing. You know that, you know, historiographically speaking. In fact, this was the best time to be a Roman. Thus, afterwards, things got worse gradually, and uh, that's for a whole different, different set of videos. But practically, 
at the Rees, especially after the Antonin plague that has been also, you know, recently rediscussed and its importance seemingly wasn't so impacting as it was thought. But let's say there is this general idea of crisis, right? Also because of the Marcomannic invasions, Marcomannic wars. Um, Marcus had a, uh, a relatively sad life because in the moment in which he managed to get himself out of the, the legal studies, as we've seen, you know, this enormous... Uh, in his boyhood, he had nothing but education, right? No other activity of sort. And then, after he became uh, emperor, and he, uh, when he was dreaming of libraries, he basically spent 17 uh, years out of 19 of reign in military campaigns, right? rather than, you know, what he, he wanted to do. So, it, it's very fascinating to look at these men for, for the few that we can know, but trying to outline a psychological, you know, picture. And that's something with Marcus Aurelius, we, we, we usually have this advantage of the meditations to, to look at. So speaking of his origins, the Gens Anya, uh, to which Marcus Aurelius belonged, uh, was not particularly important historically. Um, their, their only actu actually famous member was Milo, Yes, the, the one that killed Claudius, Titus Annius Mill at the end of uh, the Republic, also there, you know, just famous for political violence. Uh, essentially, he, has, he was defended by Kikara, but not, you know, there isn't much there. So um, his paternal family actually originated in Ukubi, which is a small town in southeast of Cordoba, in uh, the Iberian Baetica. So, so as you know, one of the most florid and, in fact, deeply Romanized um, provinces of the empire. Their origin was Italic, by the way, because these were all the, you know, the, the rich, uh, essentially Italians who had been sent to govern around various provinces, naturally also connecting with the local elites, um, familial ties, and so on. So we talk about Hispano-Italic uh, background. Um, the family rose to prominence uh, in the late 1st century AD, so relatively early. Um, there is this series of ancestors that were called all the same, so we distinguish them by primus, secundus, and tertius, that they are all known as Marcus Annius Verus. So his great-grandfather was Marcus Annius Verus uh, Primus. Uh, he was a senator, you know, um, and according to the Historia Augusta, an ex praetor, right? And in 73-74 AD, his grandfather, Marcus Annius Verus Secundus, was made a patrician. So they elevated from... Uh, they, were, they were actually... Um, I didn't say it. Was a, they were a plebeian family, right? Plebeians doesn't mean that they were poor. Uh, the richest plebeians were, you know, definitely better off than the poorest patricians. But still, for the, uh, you know, the career, the, the civilian military career, the, the, there was a specific... Um, you know, difference for, of background in this regard. So they had been nobilitated over time. And Cassius Dio says that the Anni were uh, near kin of Hadrian, which probably is the only reason uh, how they, they came to to be in the imperial milieu in the first place, right? Uh, albeit we don't exactly know what these kinships, um, what this, this kinship ties actually were. Right. There is no source sell, uh, saying that. Uh, it's been there are some conjectures, right? That, for example, um, through Annius Verus Secundus' wife, Rupilia Faustina, uh, um, who was the daughter of the consular senator Libo Rupilius Frugi and a named mother, um, well, uh, the family could be uh, uh, related to Matidia. Right, uh, so that would have been hypothetically Rupilia's mother, right? Matidia was also the mother, presumably even in here. So that that's how hypothetically it is to another marriage of Vibia Sabina, that was Hadrian's wife, right? Uh, the important though here is that Verus' elder son, Marcus Aurelius' father, Marcus Annus Verus Tertius, married Domitia Lucilla Minor. Right, so these were his parents. Uh, Lucilla was the daughter of the patrician um, Calvisius Tullus Ruso and uh, Domitia Lucilla Maior. 
Now, Domitian Lucid La Mayor had inherited a huge fortune that is described at length in one of Pliny's letters from her maternal grandfather and her paternal grandfather by adoption. It's a lot of money. Um, the younger Lucilla at this point would acquire much of her mother's wealth uh, that included even a large brickwork uh, on the outskirts of Rome and here Rome was still growing as the, the large, enormous parasitary metropolis of the, you know, the heart of the empire um, so brickworks were fundamental for the city construction boom, right, so uh, more money to be made for it now Lucilla and Verus Tertius so had two children, a son, Marcus Aurelius, that was born, as we've seen, on April the 26th, 121, and Annia Corfinicia Faustina, right, uh, Marcus' sister, thus, uh, who was probably born in either 122-123. Verus Tertius probably died uh, as early as 124 during his praetorship. So this was when Marcus Aurelius was only three years old. Still, as you know, in Roman, you know, Roman culture, it says, you know, paternal line is fundamental here. The, there was the, the broader, you know, public involvement in these figures. As, as you understand, these were big guys. The, the family had had consulship um, twice. Um, the, these were important uh, magistrates, etc. So Marcus Aurelius naturally lived also in, in the memory of his ancestors. And he wrote in his meditations that he had learned, quote, modesty and manliness from his memory of his father, right? Uh, and also from, in fact, uh, his, mm, his father's posthumous reputation in the first place. Because once again, that in this broad clientelly reality, you know, that was a mark of, you know, uh, as, as heirs, these people lived on in, in the legacy of, 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 their, of their ancestors. His, uh, Marcus Aurelius' mother did not remarry, interestingly enough. In fact, Lucilla uh, was to, uh, you know, was, was in charge at some point of the education of his uh, son. At least, you know, uh, she, uh, she didn't spend much time with him, though. This was typical in aristocratic society. He, Marcus Aurelius was ra uh, raised by the nurses, right? And uh, he remembers... Uh, his mother teaching him, quote, religious piety, simplicity in diet, right, and to how to avoid, quote, the ways of the rich. So this modesty that the Roman elite had maintained as, a, as an ideal, right? You know, you'll see how this also intertwines with Stoicism. If you wonder why, you know, Stoicism was so, you know, successful in Rome in the first place, it's because already the Roman, you know, uh, the Roman mentality was, was much along that pattern of, Probation, you know, modesty, simplicity, etc. In the front of you know, this necessity of the of this big gentes to to always reinvest their own their own wealth to expand for for this public religious duties and so on. Um, in his letters, Marcus Aurelius makes frequent and affectionate reference to his mother. Indeed, he was grateful that quote, although she was fated to die young, and she would, yet she spent her last years with me. Uh, she's very touching you think about it um, as you know uh, in Rome the um, you know the, the the patria potestas existed so after the uh, after his father's death Marcus Aurelius was adopted by his paternal grandfather Marcus Aurelius Verus Secundus so that it's as if they were sons literally at that point legally and uh, there was also another man, Lucius C Catilius Severus, um, participating in his upbringing. Uh, Severus is described as Marcus Aurelius' maternal great-grandfather as well, and he was probably uh, the stepfather of the elder Lucilla. Marcus Aurelius was raised in the home of his mother, the Horti Domitiae Lucillae, on the Cilian Hill, or Celian Hill if you prefer, um, uh, a district that uh, he would, in fact, refer to as affectionately as uh, Mycelian, right? Um, and uh, it was actually an upscale region. There were uh, a few public buildings, but many aristocratic villas there. And the most famous of these villas was the Lateran Palace, right? The Lateran Palace has a long history. It was seized under Nero 
um, and uh, from private from privates right from the uh, from the Gens Laterana right and it was a, a family um, and uh, thenceforth um, imperial public it would remain and Marcus Aurelius grandfather owned his palace besides the Lateran so um, this is also the place by the way where Marcus Aurelius would spend much of his childhood uh, as well um, so Marcus Aurelius also thanks his father for teaching him quote good character and avoidance of bad temper mm -hmm. uh, he liked much less his grandfather's mistress uh, who uh, he had taken after the death of his wife Rupilia Faustina and historians have detected some kind of sexual tension in Marcus Aurelius when writing on on the mistress right and um, he explicitly said that he was grateful not to have lived with her longer than he did uh, also about you know his sexual visions uh, at the time uh, in the meditations there is a quote in which he said that uh, he was uh, glad not to have lost vir his virginity in due time to have actually held out a bit longer even than um, and the average that he didn't indulge himself with these two probably household slaves uh, named Benedicta um, and Theodotus, which would be normal. You know that slaves were basically used. There, there was, there were, uh, you know, naturally in these imperial households, slaves were well treated by slavery standards, but. Yeah, they literally were considered like objects, and they you could have sex with them um, whenever you wanted. Like you, you can imagine the the degree of abuse, or not only uh, presumably, but the, the important was that being slaves, even if you had legitimate sons, nobody cared because legally they they were not to inherit anything, right? And sometimes these people were raised uh, alongside the other children as well, so there were important connections in this regard too. Um, so speaking of Marcus Aurelius' education, which is really the big topic there, because that's literally all what he had in his youth. But he had 19 of the freaking best professors in the world uh, empire at the time. So uh, actually an astonishing amount of, of individuals, as you understand. And also very different, and but would have um, more or less individually, but still altogether a great importance in his in his in his life is an intellectual uh, formation so as an aristocrat marcus would be told at home right uh, he thanked uh, catilius severus for encouraging him to avoid public schools which were deemed to be uh, you know at this time considered that uh, there was the highest level of literacy you know of roman history Right, you had to wait 14th century Florence to have the same level of of, um, of literacy in, in Europe, uh, and um, the um, naturally the private schools were, uh, I mean, uh, the, the public schools were for the uh, for the commoners. Let's say um, the nobility would and understandably uh, enjoy the services of these tutors. Uh, three of his, um, three of Marcus Aurelius' childhood are known, right? Euphoric, Geminus, and an unnamed educator, specifically educator, just like the word in English. Um, it's interesting because if if he hadn't talked about them, they would have not been attested in in any other source, right? Uh, these were probably household slaves or freedmen at least. Euphoric is naturally an Hellenic name. He may have taught Marcus the basics of Greek as we will see it was like a double language for Roman uh, for Loma, for the Roman elite like it's like today you speak English right? Greek was fundamental um, and um, the, 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 the same Euphoric seems to have taught Marcus literature specifically Geminus is instead described as an actor, and in fact, he may have told Marcus Latin pronunciation and general elocution. You know that, you know, Latin literature has an important, um, you know, uh, space given to to the theater works. Since think about Plautus, all this tradition was, you know, in the very origin, 
in, in the archaic times of Rome, like properly a foreign thing, something that uh, a true Roman should never engage in, in, together with literature altogether, because Romans are just warriors. Now we are in the full Hellenized, uh, let's say Hellenistic Roman Empire, and the, the, naturally the, the thing was very different. And Latin theatrical literature naturally is uh, very important because it teaches you the, qua the vocal quantities, the you know the, the lyric, the, the, the rhythms, uh, etc. So it was very important for speaking as well. As for the educator, the unknown educator, this would have been Marcus' overall supervisor, charged with his moral welfare in general development. So a guy that basically, you know, just supervised his uh, work, his activity, his behavior, and said, okay, well, you know, could be a, you know, a friend, etc. In fact, Marcus speaks of him with admiration in his meditation. He says that he told him to, quote, bear pain and be content with little to work with my own hands, to mind my own business, to be slow to listen to slander. At the age of 12, Marcus would have been ready for secondary education under the Grammatici, so this is like middle school fundamentally, but already advanced for, for Roman standards, it's like as if they, he entered the, the high school deal. right? So two of his teachers, uh, for modern comparisons, two of his teachers... Um, are are known at this age. One is Andro, who was, quote, a geometrician and musician. The other is, famously enough, Diognetus, a painting master. Uh, uh, Marcus actually thought highly of Diognetus, not just as a painter. This is interesting, as, as, you know, just as a visual art teacher, etc. In fact, um, uh, he seems to have introduced Marcus to philosophy or to a philosophic way of life. In fact, um, the same Marcus writes that Diognetus had told him, quote, to avoid passing enthusiasms, to distrust the stories of miracle workers and impostors about incantations and exorcism of spirits and such things, not to go cockfighting or to get excited about such sports, to put up with outspokenness, and to become familiar with philosophy, and to f write philosophical dialogues in, in my boyhood. So you, you already understand this, this boy's, you know, inclination. He, he was very much of a, you know, grave, uh, intellectual young man. He, he was smart, definitely, for his age. And he took his, um, his business very seriously. Right, his education evidently acquainted him with certain dimensions that he found to be very thought provoking and fascinating. He was, you know, very appreciative towards his masters. In April 132, at be the behest of uh, Diognetus, Marcus took up the dress and habits of the philosopher proper. He studied while wearing a rough uh, Hellenic cloak and would sleep on the ground until his mother convinced him to sleep on a bed. So, already also this. However, uh, I can't say tormented, but you know, still this, in fact, pre-stoic uh, vision of, of of life is to be, you know, to essentially to to, to live in it in, in a serious um, way uh, by distrusting things that would uh, take you far from from what mattered, philosophically speaking, right? Uh, then there was a new set of tutors. There's really a lot of them, as we've seen uh, already. Uh, these are were Alexander of uh, Cotiaium, Trosius Aper, and Tuticius Proculus, right? Who were uh, Marcus uh, educators in around 132-33. Uh, we don't know much about the latter two, that were both uh, Latin teachers. Uh, while Alexander was actually famous, he was a major literateur of the time, the leading Homeric scholar of his days. Right? And in fact, we, we often find uh, occasional uh, Homeric quotation in Marcus Aurelius' meditation, some even at uh, the deepest, uh, as we will see, uh, events of his life. Um, and in fact, uh, Marcus 
thanks Alexander for his training in literary styling. It definitely influenced him, in, especially in the emphasis on matter over style, careful wording, and naturally, as we've seen, the Homeric quotes. Then, in 127, at the age of six, Marcus Aurelius was enrolled in the Equestrian Order on the recommendation of the Imper Emperor Hadrian. Uh, we're in Hadrian times at this point. So he had naturally been spotted by Hadrian, specifically. Um, it was actually rare for, uh, for a child to become a knight at that point. Um, it had happened, it was still unusual. In 128, Marcus was also enrolled in the priestly college of the Sali, right, that were essentially sacred dancers, uh, leaping priests specifically, uh, devoted to Mars. Right. And actually, Marcus wouldn't meet uh, the, qual the standard qualifications for entering the college as um, uh, he didn't have both of his parents alive. So even here, Hadrian intervened in his favor. And definitely having the emperor as your nominator made you definitely a, a very specially, very specially favored child at the time. Uh, Hadrian definitely had a strong affection for Marcus, and uh, he nicknamed him as Verissimus, so from Verus in his family, but, you know, it's apparently the most true, right, which is relevant. Hadrian was smart, right, um, so he could, uh, he was fascinating, especially with properly the, the guy's intelligence, and they would, they would spot that. Um, so, the Sali, as we were telling before they, they, the etymology of the name is from Salira which means to leap to dance as we've seen they were devoted to this ritual dance and enabled Mars uh, twice a year was the, the this event that basically marked respectively the, the beginning and the end of the uh, of the war season right the beginning was the Queen Quatria uh, on March the 19th which actually was in 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 the name of, of Minerva, and uh, the Armilustrium on October the 19th. It was in favor of, of in honor of, of Mars. Um, they they were important. Um, they were an important sacerdotal college because basically they they had a relevant uh, function in public ceremonies, as we've seen in this case, making the opening and closing of the campaign season. Right, and on other days in March and October, and especially during the festival of Mars from um, the first to the twenty fourth of March, they would essentially march through the streets of Rome, halting at uh, intervals to perform their ritual dances, uh, beat their shields with with staffs, and singing the Carmen Saliare. It was known or in fragment. It was a uh, a hymn in archaic Latin, um, and the song would be would have been nearly unintelligible at that point. But Marcus or, had to learn it by heart to perform these dances that were essentially a, a martial martial exercise, right? They they, um, they they were equipped with an archaic equipment with specific shields and and, and lances, etc. And they they would you know perform this these moves in an acrobatic sense to show the you know the, the physical fitness of the warriors in in, in the um, in a athleticistic um, uh, sense uh, in in honor of of Mars in that regard. And Marcus rose through the offices of the priesthood, right? He became eventually the leader of the dance proper. The Batas, that is the prophet, you know, the, the, the you know the Batas in Latin is this sort of soothsayer in the in the European tradition is the one who properly gets you know from from the divinity uh, this, um, this this knowledge this capacity uh, and sacred as the, the, the priestly class does, um, and he eventually became master of the order proper. Um, and once, when the Sali were throwing their crowns on the banqueting couch of the gods, as customary, Marcus fell on the brow of Mars. So, in later years, this event would be read at this time as an auspicious omen heralding Marcus' uh, future empire. Right. Um, 
Hadrian, as we were saying before, was present in Marcus Aurelius' life, but not in his childhood specifically, because you know that Hadrian basically stayed out of Rome most of his reign on the frontier, dealing with uh, administrative and military local affairs um, in the provinces. By 135, however, he returned to Italy for good, right? He had grown close to Lucius Caeonius Commodus, the was husband of the daughter of Gaius Avidius Nigrinus, a dear friend of Hadrian, whom the, this, uh, this emperor, the same emperor had killed early in his reign. Uh, in 136, shortly after, Marcus assumed the toga virilis, symbolizing his passage into manhood. This happened in spring, right? If you were born after that, you have to wait an entire year, so it was a cycle, it doesn't matter. So it means that you could become... Uh, Men legally from either very close to still to being 15 to be 17, spanning this 16th year of age, um, or or more or less, in fact, be due to, to this thing. But that meant that uh, he, he could legally marry. So uh, Hadrian, at that point, arranged uh, Marcus' engagement to one of Commodus' daughters, Caeonia Fabia. As, as we will see, he will not marry because of Antonina's different plans for, for, for his daughter, actually. But th this was very important because it connected him, at, uh, Marcus, uh, at the time, even, even closer to, to the imperial milieu. Also, Marcus at this time was made prefect of the city during the Feriae Latinae, soon, soon after his engagement. He was probably appointed by the same Commodus. And although the office held no real administrative significance because the full-time prefect remained in office during the festival, it remained a prestigious office for young aristocrats and members of the imperial fame. Right? And seemingly Marcus conducted himself well at the, at the job. Um, in true Commodus, Marcus met Apollonius of Chalcedon, who was a Stoic philosopher. Apollonius had taught Commodus already, and it would be an enormous... Um, impact on Marcus Aurelius, who uh, would later study with him regularly, and he's one of, of the only three people uh, Marcus thanks for the thanks the gods for having met, right? And about this time, uh, Marcus' sister Anna Cornificia married Umidius Quadratus, that was her first cousin. Uh, Domitia Lucilla Minor asked at this point Marcus Aurelius to give part of his father's inheritance to his sister, right, as a dowry, and he agreed to give her all of it, right, content as he was of, with his grandfather's estate. It was generous of him for his sister. Um, so, in late 136, Hadrian was about to die because of a hemorrhage, and he, while he was convalescent in his uh, villa in Tivoli, a pretty famous one, um, he selected Lucius Caeonius Commodus as his successor and adopted him as his son. Right. So basically now, this made Marcus engaged with the daughter of the um, future heir of the empire. Right. Um, so this selection, however, was done according to the um to to the sources in vitis omnibus that means against the you know the, the actually the opinion of of everybody um and we don't understand why hadrian chose the this this man as his successor and commodus once adopted took the name of lucius aelius kaiser so after fundamentally the after hadrian and the normal imperial heirs name of Caesar. And after a brief station in the Danubian frontier, uh, Aelius returned to Rome to make an address to the Senate on the first date of 138. However, the night before the speech, he grew ill and died of a hemorrhage la later in the day. So on January 24, 138, Hadrian, remained without hair, selected Aurelius Antoninus as his new successor. Um, and after a few days' considerations, Antoninus accepted. He was adopted on February the 25th. 
And as part of Hadrian's terms, Antoninus adopted Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Commodus, the son of Aelius. Mm -hmm. So they became now for the specifically legal sons of the heir of the empire. So even, you know, this would, there was evidently something there they had spotted about uh, Marcus. Also, well, Lucius Commodus, that is basically Lucius Verus, uh, was, as we have seen, the, the, the son of this other protege of Hadrian that had even appointed him before his death as uh, his successor. Um, and uh, another, properly, that was the, the, the realization that Marcus would have become one day emperor uh, too. Mm -hmm. uh, or, yeah, there was a strong possibility. At this point, Marcus became uh, Marcus Aelius Aurelius Verus, while Lucius became Lucius Aelius Aurelius Commodus. Right? So basically, uh, gaining the, gaining the, the Hadrianic and Antonine. Um, uh, names fundamentally plus the ones of their own uh, their own origin the, their own uh, cognomina and uh, respect and at Hadrian's request Antoninus' daughter Faustina was betrothed to Lucius uh, the night of his adoption Marcus had a dream he dreamed that he um, had shoulders of ivory and when asked if they could bear burden, he found them much stronger than before. He was appalled to learn that Hadrian had adopted them, actually. And only with reluctance did he move from his mother's house on the Cilian to Hadrian's private home. He actually lived in Tiberius' palace. Right. At some time in 138, Hadrian requested the Senate that Marcus Aurelius be exempt from the law, bearing him from becoming quaestor before his 24th birthday, as it would have been lawful, uh, the Senate complied, and Marcus served under Antoninus, consul for 139. Marcus Aurelius' adoption uh, diverted him from the typical career path of his class, because otherwise he would have probably become, you know, would have gotten this kind of um, minor offices, like, for example, Triumphir Monetalis, who was one of the three monitors appointed in ancient Rome to oversee the minting of coins, uh, that was, however, a highly regarded post involving token administration of state men, though. And after that, he could have served as a tribune with a legion, right, for the military career, becoming essentially the, the legion's nominal second in command. Um, and Marcus, probably by inclination, would have preferred to travel uh, for further education in, in the East, probably. Um, so he had, naturally, his adoption brought him, uh, he was very young, as you understand, so this is probably a completely different path. And think about the burden, the responsibility, that dream tells it all, in a sense. Um, and, but that's how much, you know, all these older, you know, rulers actually counted on him for. Um, which is extraordinary to see, uh, even historically speaking, to have been spot, um, I can't think even of just, I don't know, of, of Octavian spot by Caesar, but not the only hair, but still in the most conspicuous one from, from for his intelligence. Maybe it's not a coincidence after all. Um, nonetheless, um, Marcus' biographer attests that his character remained unaffected by this. Right? He, um, you know, he had been once just an ordinary citizen after all, and he um, he also adapted, if you want, to this new life of court that, as we will see, was not that um, that easy for him. He actually despised it, in part. Uh, tried to adapt to it and not changing his uh, his mood about the whole thing. Now, Hadrian, uh, at this point, was faring pretty badly. He attempted suicide. It was sa uh, saved by Antoninus, fundamentally. So, eventually, he left for Baiae. The, this famous, um, you know, seaside resort on the Campanian coast. And his health did not improve, so he stopped basically mm, listening to his doctors, for example, regarding his um, diet. He indulged into food and drink, so okay, I'm gonna die anyway, so what the hell cares? 
Um, and um, he sent for Antoninus, who was uh, at his side when he died on July the 10th, 138. Uh, Hadrian was buried quietly at Putelli. Uh, at this point, Marcus Aurelius held gladiatorial games at Rome in his honor while Pius fin finalized Hadrian's burial arrangements. And uh, the succession to Antoninus was peaceful and stable. Right, uh, he was well. You know, th that's important in in Roman history because usually, you know, that there wasn't like a, a truly institutionalized successory system. Here, it went very smoothly. Antoninus kept Hadrian's nominees in office and appeased the Senate, respecting its privileges, commuting certain death sentence uh, death sentences of men charged in, in Hadrian's last days were considered as. Um, unfair and and for his dutiful behavior also Antoninus was asked and accepted the name of Pius as a cognome uh, because he was a balanced equilibrated you know respectful individual religiously politically wise etc so um, basically immediately after Hadrian's death Antoninus approached Marcus Aurelius and requested him to change his marriage and um, um, arrangements. In fact, uh, Marcus Aurelius' betrothal to Caiona Fabia was annulled uh, and he would be betrothed to Antoninus' daughter, Faustina, instead. Um, conversely, Faustina's betrothal to Caiona's brother, Lu Lucius Commodus, would also have been annulled, right? Marcus uh, agreed with this. Um, and Pius, by the way, uh, Antoninus, uh, Pius at this point bolstered Marcus' dignity further. He was made consul for 140 AD um, with the same uh, Antoninus as his colleague. Uh, also, Marcus was appointed as a Severi. There was basically one of the six commanders of the Roman knights. Uh, and at the Order's annual parade on July the 15th, 139. Uh, given that Marcus was uh, Antoninus' heir apparent, he became known as Princeps Juventutis, so Prince of, of Youth, right? Uh, head of the Equestrian Order. Uh, and he now took also the name of Kaiser. Marcus Aelius Aurelius Verus Kaiser. So Marcus at this point would actually be humble about his title. He wrote, quote, See that you do not turn into Caesar. Do not be dipped into the purple dye, for that can happen. Right. Um, also, the Senate requested um, Marcus to join all the priestly colleges, which he did. So the Pontifices, the Augures, the Quindecimviri, the sac uh, qu uh, quind uh, Quindecimviri Sacris fa Faciundis, the Septemviri Epulonum, and, and others. Um, and uh, however, the the only f mm, uh, explicit evidence we have for his joining was is the for the mm, the Harvard uh, brethren. Um, college, of which also um, Lucius Verus will be part. Um, Antoninus also demanded that Marcus took um, to take residence in the house of the Berus, the imperial palace on the Palatine. Yes, I was wrong before. Uh, it, it wasn't Hadrian who had it, um, you know, in, in Tiberius Palace, but but Antoninus, Hadrian, just in his uh, is in his own. Um, but um, also Antoninus made Marcus take up the habits of his the new station, specifically the so-called Aulicum Fastigium, so like the pomp of the court in a sense, um, which, uh, as we were saying before, Marcus was, wasn't uh, happy of <laughs> at all, right? He had problems to reconcile with the courtly life um, because of his philosophic yearnings, mostly. And he told himself at some point uh, that it was fundamentally an attainable uh, goal. 
despite difficulty, said where life is possible, then it is possible to live the right life. Mm -hmm. Life is possible in a palace, so it is possible to live the right life in a palace. So it was pretty logical. Um, and uh, he would actually criticize himself at some point in meditation for uh, for abusing court life in front of, of company. Uh, also, however, Marcus had a great respect towards Antoninus Pius. He gave us this tribute to him in the first book of the Meditations, which is the longest um, in absolute terms in, in the work. And it's seemingly Antoninus Pius influenced him the, the most uh, in his life uh, as a single figure. He says, from my father, of course, talking about, the, you know, he, he was at that point his son, legally, and that's what the Romans would think like. From my father, gentleness and unshaken resolution in judgments taken after full examination. No vainglory about external honors. Love of work and perseverance. Readiness to hear those who had anything to contribute to the public advantage. The desire to reward every man according to his desert without partiality. The experience that uh, knew were to tighten the rein were to relax. Prohibition of unnatural practices, social tact and permission to his suite not invariably to be present at his banquets nor to attend his progress from Rome as a matter of obligation. And always to be found uh, the, the same by those who had failed to attend him through engagements. Exact scrutiny in counsel and patience, not that he was avoiding investigation satisfied with first impressions. An inclination to keep his friends, and nowhere fastidious or the victim of many, but his own master in everything, and his outward man cheerful. His long foresight and ordering of the merest trifle without making scenes. Uh, the check in his reign put upon organized applause and every form of lip service, his unceasing watch over the needs of the empire and his stewardship of its resources, his patience under criticism by individuals of such conduct, no superstitious fear of divine powers, nor with a man any courting of, of the public or obsequ obsequiousness or cultivation of popular favor, but temperance in all things and firmness. Nowhere want of taste or search for novelty. So, as Quaestor, Marcus um, didn't actually have much administrative work to do, right? His main task was essentially reading imperial letters to the Senate when Antoninus was absent, and he would essentially carry out secretarial work for the senators as well. Um, and as a consul, instead, his work was more mm, committing um, because um, he was one of the two senior re representatives of the Senate. So he had to preside over meetings and take a major role in the body's administrative functions. Um, and he felt, at that point, drowned in uh, paperwork. Right? He complained to this with his tutor, we'll see, Fronto, saying... Quote, I am so out of breath, breath from dictating nearly 30 letters. Think about this, right? This is all public. That is, in practice, you can't screw up. Or, and, and the, 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 you know, all his education at that point would, would have come handy. But still, it was much of a work for a young man. And uh, he was properly being formed to be a statesman at that point, right? So ha making these speeches at that point was a major political uh, you know uh, necessity right oratorial skills um, to the assembled senators was functional to imperial policy um, and so on and in January the first 145 Marcus was also made counsel for a second time right and we think he might have been sick at this point um, because from a letter from uh, to fr uh, from Fronto, we get that he may have uh, Marcus may have needed to to sleep more enough. Uh, so, quote: So that you may come into the Senate with good color and read your speech with a strong voice. Right. Think about properly the psychophysical pressure of all this. Um, 
Marcus was was um, apparently sickly. Uh, he was, um, you know, he suffered of illnesses most of his life, and in spite of this, he he managed to to carry out his uh, duty. Anyway, in in one of his letters, he complained, "Quote: As far as my strength is concerned, I am beginning to get it back, and there is no trace of the pain in my chest. But that ulcer, I am having treatment and taking care not to do anything that interferes with it." Right. So he wasn't that healthy or strong, apparently. Um, the same Cassius Dio, uh, Cassius Dio um, praised him specifically for being dutifully, as we have seen, in spite of his various illnesses. And in April 145, Marcus married Faustina, right, as it had been planned fundamentally for, from seven years before. Um, so, um, given that Faustina was Antonino's daughter and and Marcus was uh, Antonino's adopted son. Well, under Roman law, he he was Marcus was basically marrying his sister. Um, so um, the, um, uh, the the this took Antonino's uh, patria potestas to intervene to to allow the ceremony taking place. In spite of all, well, he was the emperor; he could really do whatever he wanted. Um, and uh, we don't know much about the the ceremony, but it's been said to have been remarkable. We have coins issued with the heads of the couple, and Pius as Pontifex Maximus would have officiated, so literally the, the top um, sacerdotal authority in the empire. Um, and um, Marcus doesn't actually speak to uh, uh, about marriage in his letters, he makes scanty references to to Faustina altogether, which is normal given the the you know the tone of of the work, not because he uh, he didn't care, actually. Um, speaking further of his intellectual events, you know, after having taken Toga Virilis in one hundred thirty six, Marcus probably began his training in oratory that would, seem, would become soon quite important to him. So he had three tutors in in the Hellenic language. There were uh, Aninus Macer, Caninius Keller, and Herodes Atticus, and one in Latin, Fronto. Right, of course, they spoke Latin, so they didn't need uh, as much as education as, as to, say, to learn from scratch than that, but still was important, as we've seen, for eloquence, oratorial skills, etc., to have a master in his native language as well. Um, um, the uh, Fronto and Atticus, however, probably did not become tutors until uh, Antoninus adopted him in 138. Right? Uh, the preponderance of Hellenic teachers here shows how important the language was in among the Roman aristocracy. As we were saying before, uh, the empire was uh, witnessing the second sophistic, so a sort of renaissance in Hellenic letters. Um, and uh, the same meditations by Marcus are in, in Greek, right? So it was in their most thought. As we were saying, it's like in the 19th century, people wrote French, you know, aristocrats could write in French in Europe normally. In, in, in the 20th century, English uh, took over. So it was Greek at the time. So... Um, these um, two last front and articles were, you know, some of the, the, the most esteemed orators of the time. So you were talking about top education you know, in the empire for Marcus. Um, there was um, a tutor in law, legal studies too, that was Lucius Volusius Maecianus, was a knight that Antoninus had taken on staff at his adoption by Hadrian. And the director of, of the um, of the public post as praefectus vehiculorum. Now, Apollonius um, also was compelled to return to Chalcedon um, in uh, to Rome at the request of Pius, and would continue teaching Marcus, as uh, seen. Then there is the figure of Herodes Atticus is a bit controversial together. He was probably the richest man in the eastern half of the empire. 
he was a uh, kind of a kind of, kind of a tamper. Uh, he was all about uh, you know, let's say the, the the metaphorical oratory rather to vigorous attack. Right? He he liked graceful speech. Um, to use the description of Philostratus um, that wrote about the lives of the sophists. Um, and uh, Atticus was actually a, an inveterate opponent of Stoicism and philosophical pretensions altogether. Um, once he allegedly g gave a tramp calling um, himself a philosopher money to buy bread for a month, right? publicly declaiming men posing as philosophers all the time. Uh, he believed that the, the Stoics' desire for apatheia to be foolish. They would live, quote, a sluggish, enervated life, according to him. So it's very meaningful that, in spite of this tutor, Marcus actually became a Stoic himself, right? And as much as Herodes is not mentioned at all in Marcus' meditations, right? In spite he actually had close, you know, uh, he had a contact with him, uh, for, for many years, in, in you know, for the following decades, quite frequent. Um, but Fronto also was very esteemed, as we were saying before. He was thought at the time al almost as an alternative to Cicero in, in Latin uh, eloquence, right? And um, um, the um, Fronto didn't care much for Herodes, right? Marcus was eventually to put the pair in speaking terms. Fronto had a complete mastery of Latin. Um, he uh, had this, uh, you know, wordsmith capacity, right, through literature to produce obscure synonyms. And, you know, Latin literature can be very, very, very refined, very subtle. Uh, he was working properly for epirating uh, the the so the speech from improprieties in any word choice whatever, considered that at this point uh, Latin literature uh, was fundamentally oblivious of what had been the, the so-called Silver Age. These all those first century uh, A.D. Uh, authors such as Seneca, Lucan, Martial, Juvenal, Pliny, Suetonius, Tacitus, etc. Right? They uh, the empire at this point was kind of looking back at this idea of golden age, right? Um, in all sense, so drawing directly from Virgil, Cicero, um, uh, and uh, together with with other specific figures like Cato, Plautus, Terence, Gaius Gracchus, um, Sallust too. They were often Cited. Um, this is a bit of an elitistic attitude, but still, it, it's important to to properly also understand what the style really was about, what were the models of reverence um, at this point. And uh, we have this beautiful correspondence between Marcus and Fronto, right? That we were very, very close, right? Marcus at one point writes, farewell, my front of wherever you are, my most sweet love and delight. How is it being you and me? I love you and you are not here, right? Marcus also spent a lot of time with Fronto's wife and daughter that were both named Kratia, right? They, they enjoyed conversation and they were very close to the whole familiar background here. Um, and uh, the, uh, he, Marcus wrote Fronto a letter once on his birthday claiming to love him as he loved himself, calling on the gods to ensure that every word he learned of literature would learn, quote, from the lips of Fronto, right? It seems Fronto was quite sickly, uh, almost uh, an invalid uh, because of his health problems. And in fact, almost, you know, one quarter of the surviving letters between Marcus and Fronto deal with the man's sickness, right? And Marcus uh, asks Fronto pain to be inflicted on himself, right? You know, quote, of my own accord with every kind of discomfort to, you know, in this already stoic attitude. Fronto never became Marcus' full-time teacher, right, uh, and continued his career as an advocate, mostly, and, and, and that brought him in contrast with Herodes at some point, um, because um, Fronto had been retained as defense counsel by Tiberius Claudius Demostratus, that was a prominent Athenian, um, uh, that um, Herodotus Atticus was chief prosecutor in this, and uh, 
So there was, you know, all an attack on Herodotus' character in this sense. And Marcus asked um, Front to, to, you know, spare much crit not, not to attack Herodotus in this context. And uh, Fronto replied that he was surprised to discover that Marcus actually counted uh, on, uh, Herodotus as a friend, right? Perhaps it was not uh, his tutor yet at that time. But he agreed that Marcus' advice might be correct, and he decided not to inter you know, to, to be too harsh, right? And still he said, you know, he would, um, you know, he would, make use of the material available he said quote i warn you that i won't even use in a disproportionate way the opportunity that i have in my case for the charges are frightful and must be spoken of as frightful those in particular which refer to the beating and robbing i will describe in such a way that the, they savor of gold and bile if i happen to call him an educated little creek it will not mean war to the death um so <laughs> Marcus actually accepted this, you know, provocation um, to Herodotus by, by front. We don't know how this trial eventually went, um, but uh, we, we know that Marcus managed in reconcile Fronto and Herodotus. Also, um, Marcus wrote um, a letter in um, soon after Frontus Tenere's consul Suffectus in July and August 143, mentioning that Herodotus' newborn son had recently died, uh, and uh, asking Fronto to write Herodotus a note of condolences. And in fact, Fronto did because we have a, a, a letter written in Greek surviving uh, witnessing this, um, and eventually Fronto himself eventually. Um, thanked and praised Marcus as a reconciler, he said, quote, if anyone ever had power by his character to unite all his friends in mutual love for one another, you will surely accomplish this much more uh, easily. In the meanwhile, when he was around 25, Marcus was, was growing discontent uh, with his studies in jurisprudence that he had undertaken, as we have seen for his also political administrative tasks um, and he began to feel fundamentally uh, you know tired about the, the, this wall of fort um, um, his master he writes to Fronto was uh, an unpleasant blowhard and had made a hit at him right he, he said it is easy to sit yawning next to a judge uh, he says but to be a judge is a noble work and um, he, uh, Marcus was more interested in, you know, this dialogues, in this imaginary debates. Um, he criticized the insincerity of the conventional language, um, and front of actually took to defend it. Uh, in any case, um, what we think of the proper education of the man was over, right? He had maintained his teachers. Uh, close to him in good terms, he fo he had followed them devoutly. Uh, he, uh, you know, he he properly kept gold statues of their of his teachers in his private chapel and honored them, uh, their tombs, right uh, after that by personal visits. Um, and um, this, all this work possibly might have affected Marcus adversely. Right, he uh, basically all we can learn from Marcus' boyhood. It's about studying, nothing else. Um, and still, at this point, Marcus was was ever more interested in philosophy. He wanted properly to roam free in this regard. Imagine having had this this enormous commitment and then ha having learned so much of wanting to explore intellectually other another universe. Fronto had, however, been adverse to philosophy, right? He um, properly mm, discouraged him to, you know, to, to follow philosophy, philosophers. And um, he was not happy about Marcus' sessions with Apollonius of Chalcedon and others in that circle. Fronto even 
um, styled out the concept of Marcus' conversion to philosophy. Right. He uh, noted uh, somewhat uh, the, the fact that Marcus had escaped philos uh, had escaped the rhetorical training he had undergone to for philosophy. Right. And in spite of this divergence, what front of the two remained in um, you know in close uh, touch. Right, and Marcus was, was tolerant about um, Frontus' scrabbles, etc. Uh, at this point, Apollonius of Chalcedon may have properly introduced Marcus Aurelius to Stoic philosophy that he had already known, but not, you know, properly being taught. Right. Uh, still, however, Quintus Junius Rusticus um, uh, had would have maintained the strongest influence on on Marcus. Um, he was the man front to recognize as having wooed Marcus away from oratory, specifically. He was 20 years older than Marcus. Uh, Aurelius was older than Fronto himself, right? He he was, um, um, Quintus Unius Rusticus was the grandson of um, Arulenus Rusticus, who they had been one of the victims of the mission um, tyranny, let's say. He was thus... Uh, within the wake of, this, uh, le let's say, the legacy of the Stoic opposition to the bad emperors of the first century. So th this is uh, like S uh, Seneca's successor, right, in, in a sense, ideologically, uh, as opposed to Fronto, it was the false one, let's say. So all an idea, essentially, of... Uh, the it's difficult here to frame also politically because um, these are very different times from the ones of Nero, from that, you know, or the mission. Um, but still, let's say, we're in the wake of that stoicism that you can still find even in, in Cato during the civil wars in the late Republic, etc. That, um, and that kind of, the same anti Caesarian. Uh, you know, the justification for Caesar assassination was this idea of the of democratic republicanism, right? You know, of, of that at the same time was inspiring to the stoic attitude against the the, the tyrant and this idea of um, of uh, alleged at least uh, oligarchic equality. Uh, we can't say in um, in Roman in Roman aristocracy in Roman times, which now uh, it it is fascinating that we would have become a sole emperor in a much more monarchic reality than it had been in the past and it also attributed uh, great um, you know, respect to and also looking for example the one he had towards Antoninus himself would dedicate to this if you want anti-monarchic um, philosophical ideas um, which naturally are not entirely this, because the Stoicism is a broader look at the, the universe and existence, etc. So um, I don't know, frankly, how much of this political bias actually penetrated Marcus' uh, intentions, let's say. But um, still, um, it, it's it's interesting in, in perspective, and also regarding to the uh, the various opinions these thinkers held. Um, towards uh, that were all intertwined with, also with literary styles, etc. Right. The fact that, for example, Marcus thanks Rusticus um, um, t for teaching him not to be led straight into enthusiasm for rhetoric, for writing on speculative themes, for discourse and moralizing texts, to avoid oratory, poetry, and fine writing was much against the oratorical training that he had received from from front. Right, so this is interesting, also in a in a personal perspective, because you we have seen how much the young Marcus had loved Front, uh, and therefore this is like um, towards the, this age, or sort of veering. He's in, in his mid twenties, veering towards another direction, right? That was some was inverted, also compared to the one the emperors of the first century that before mostly believed that kind of um, uh, that uh, you know that kind of uh, I, stoic uh, I, uh, ideal to to mitigate uh, imperial authority um, and uh, so to, to eventually become kind of more monarchic themselves but still as we have seen for example for Caligula's video like to be more democratic in fact than 
winking at the senatorial order from which these individuals also, sen you know, um, somewhat hi uh, hypocritically came from. But anyhow, uh, there was another friend of Marcus Claudius Severus, right? Was a from an Hellenic family of Paphlagonia. Gave Marcus an understanding of what properly um, these philosophers stood for. Severus was not a Stoic; he was a peripatetic, that is, an, an Aristotelian. Um, and his influence also um, shows um, Marcus uh, the broadening of Marcus. Uh, philosophical horizons uh, altogether so that he acqu was acquainted with other uh, philosophical perspectives too. too. Um, he was properly fascinated with, by philosophy uh, altogether. Um, and Marcus thanks three other friends for their influence were Claudius Maximus, Sextus of Chironeia and Cinna Catulus. Mm -hmm. Maximus is one of Marcus uh, three most significant friends alongside Apollonius and Rusticus, right? He uh, told Marcus, quote, the mastery of self, right? To be cheerful in all circumstances, which also in his life, as we'll see in a while, we were, were not uh, beginning to be that, um, you know, in fact, that, that easy for him, with a lot of debts, um, etc., and handling responsibilities, uh, and so on. Um, differently from Marcus' other friends, Sextus was a, instead a professional philosopher. That is, he properly taught philosophy for a living, right? So he had also, intellectually speaking, some, you know, more advanced instruments. It wasn't just, you know, a, a broader taker on philosophy. Um, and he is the guy that, uh, whose lessons Marcus kept attending also after becoming emperor, scandalizing the uh, polite classes of Rome. Because as we were saying before, you know, what we're here, what did happen to the empire, right? The, our emperor should should be already fully, but by divine rule, he the one who already knows what to do, because he deserved that, right? So why does this guy follow a, essentially a Greek for, for, you know, as a teacher while he's emperor? Right. Um, Catullus instead is totally unknown inside uh, Marcus' brief words and praising the meditations, and notice in the Story Augustus, in the Story Augusta, excuse me, and um, he he might have been a senator. We we don't really know. So speaking of uh, personal life specifically, uh, and uh, children, which he had a lot, right, with Faustina, on November. Uh, the third at 137 um, his wife gave birth to a girl that was named Domitia Faustina it would have been the first of at least 14 children right including two sets of twins apparently they it was their, their this genetic uh, one of the two had this in the family as normally happens with twins in, in series let's say um, and uh, Faustina would bear over the next 23 years, children, uh, at least. And um, the uh, the next day, uh, there was December the, the 1st, 147, Antoninus gave Marcus the tribunician power and the imperium. This is very significant, as also symbolic, uh, as being able to, to have a, a progeny. Um, and uh, so the imperium here was properly taken. Right, that's what made the Roman uh, supreme ruler altogether. So it was shared with, with his adoptive father. It was the authority over the armies, the provinces of the emperor, and more generally speaking, the religious faculty of power over the empire by divine mandate. And uh, as tribune, Marcus had the right also to bring one measure before the Senate after the four Ant um, Antoninus could, right? So um, his tribunician powers would be renewed with Pius on December the 10th, 147. Uh, the first mention of Domitia, uh, so Marcus' uh, do first daughter, uh, is from her father's letter that reveal her actually as a sickly infant. Because Marcus writes, um, Caesar to Fronto, if the gods are willing, we seem to have a hope of recovery. 
The diarrhea has stopped, the little attacks of fever have been driven away, but the emaciation is still extreme, and there is still quite a, a bit of coughing. And um, he and Faustina had been very preoccupied with the girl's care, and sadly enough, uh, Domitia would die at four, right, in 151, three or four, I don't know. Um, however, Faustina gave birth again in f uh, 149, uh, the, first, the first twins, uh, twin sons specifically, and um, contemporary coinage commemorates the event. Right, there are these cross cornucopia beneath portraits, busts of the small boys, the legion temporum felicitas, so the happiness of the, of the times. Uh, however, they did not survive long either. Now, this is terribly common. Like, one third of people died in their youth, fundamentally. And uh, just imagine what, what it means uh, to, to even be born in a, in a time that differs from ours like this. Um, in, before the end of the year, in fact, another family coin was issued. It shows only a tiny girl. It was Domitia was still uh, alive, and one one baby uh, boy, then another with a girl alone, right? So that means that both the, the twins die. Uh, the infants were buried in the mausoleum of Hadrian, right? Where, in fact, their epitaphs survive, interestingly enough. Um, they were called Titus Aurelius Antoninus and Tiberius Aelius Aurelius. Uh, Marcus, mm, naturally, you, ca you can imagine, like, of course, these people were more used to such deaths, but it's not that they suffered less properly. He, he said, he, Marcus wrote, One man prays, how I may not lose my little child, but you must pray, how I may not be afraid to lose him. Right, and he quoted a, a beautiful passage from the Iliad, um, the, the what he called the briefest and most familiar saying, enough to dispel sorrow and fear, according to him, according to his philosophical views, which is Iliad 6, 146, it says, Leaves the wind scatters some on the face of the ground, like unto them are the children of men. Mm -hmm. um, however, another daughter was born, on March 150, she would live on. Anna Aurelia Galeria Lucilla. Right? At some time between 155 um, uh, and 161, probably soon after 155, Marcus Aurelius' mother, Domitia Lucilla Minor, died. Right? Um, at this point, Faustina probably had another daughter, around f 151. Um, but the child uh, that would have been Anna Galeria Aurelia Faustina might not have been born until 153. There was another son, Tiberius Aelius Antoninus, who was born in 152. There is a coin celebrating uh, properly Fecunditate Augustae, so the, the Augustus fertility, uh, depicting two girls and an infant. Uh, the boy did not survive long either. Though, on coins from 156, only the two girls are depicted. He might have died in 152, uh, which was incidentally the same year as Marcus Aurelius' sister's uh, Cornificia's death. Right. Um, so, pretty dark events from for this young, yeah, this man, mature at the time now, uh, for, for those time standards, but um, still... Uh, given the background that we have outlined, must have been harsh, uh, especially, and uh, o uh, other than just intrinsically, of course. Another son was born in the late 150s, right? And the Synod of the Temple of Dionysius at Smyrna sent Marcus Aurelius a letter of congratulation, but by March um, the 28th, 158, when Marcus replied, the child was dead. And Marcus thanked the Temple Synod, uh, even though this turned out otherwise, right? The, the child's name is unknown, right? In 159-160, Faustina gave birth to daughters, Fadilla, after one, named after one of uh, Faustina's dead sisters, and Cornificia, after Marcus' dead sister. Um, speaking of Antoninus Pius' last 
years, uh, in 152, uh, Lucius was named quaestor for 153, right? Uh, Lucius Commons, Lucius Verus. Uh, two years before the legal age of 25, right? We remember that Marcus held the office at uh, as early as 17. In 155, uh, 54, he uh, was a consul nine years before the legal age of 32. Marcus had held office at 18 and 23. Um, Lucius Verus had not other titles except the one of um, uh, son of Augustus, right? And this figure that we will talk about, as you know, that they basically ruled jointly for a while after Antoninus' death, was was a very different uh, character than Marcus. Right? He was more, way more active in uh, you know, kind of even aggressive. He enjoyed sports of all kinds. He he especially hunting, wrestling. Uh, he loved uh, circus games, gladiatorial fights. He also did not marry until 164. Um, and Antoninus Pius wasn't happy about Lucius in this sense. And he even kind of, uh, you know, admonished him in this regard. Um, he would keep him in the family, but not sure whether to give him either power or glory. In fact, Lucius would not appear on Alexandrian coinage until 160, 161, when eventually Antoninus died. Um, in 156, Pius turned 70, right? He um, uh, had starting starting to have physical difficulties at that time. It was quite of an age uh, at that point. Um, he started nibbling on dry bread to give him the strength to stay awake during his morning receptions. And probably at this point, Marcus Aurelius would have taken on more administrative duties as his father was aging. Um, more still when the Praetorian Prefect uh, that had both secretarial and military functions uh, Gavius Maximus died in 156 or 157 um, in 160 Marcus and Lucius were designated joint councils for the following year right? and perhaps Pius was already ill at that point in any case he, d- he died before the year set out um, two Days before his death, the biographer records Pius was at his ancestral estate in Laurium. He had eaten oh, this alpine cheese at dinner quite greedily. He vomited in the night. He had fever the next day. And the day after that, he summoned the imperial council um, and passed the state and his daughter to Marcus Aurelius. Also, he ordered that the golden state of Fortuna, which had been in the bedroom of the emperor, should go to Marcus Aurelius' bedroom. Then, uh, according to the story, Antoninus turned over as if going to sleep and die. Right? This was on March the 7th, 161, and Marcus Aurelius was now emperor. Right? Antoninus' reign had been very long, surpassed also the one of Tiberius in length. Just Augustus had had it um, that for that long t- uh, for a longer time. And here another age fundamentally began with him, we shall talk about that, Um, but this was to give fundamentally the background to this figure that, as you understand, is quite, uh, it is quite fascinating, because you realize that in in practice, you see, um, probably the most important thing of this all is that he hadn't received any other, like, it's not that he had another career, as it was normal, actually, for, for most emperors, if you look at how it was. Um, he, as we've seen, he had covered his offices, etc., but they had been mediated, channeled, so that he could be directly, proper, just emperor, without any other formal, you know, uh, let's say, any other concrete uh, practice of uh, of rule um, in, in other fields. So, Th- this means a lot, especially when you look at this man that was, you know, even actually versed for for intellectual studies. So he actually performed well, probably. As you know, he he's not considered a bad emperor at all. Um, he would be, you know, quite of a he he have, he was probably a man of if he was a firm individual, right? He had pretty clearly he was would have not been properly even very. Um, very warm, right? He probably knew his own deal, 
Majin, even in here, the pride, in spite of his philosophical take on life, etc., you know, there, there is a responsibility that really goes beyond in, in a, you know, in a way that we can barely understand what, what is an emperor of the 2nd century AD, a Roman emperor. I mean, it, it's something that we have, that we shouldn't also be probably be fooled by just by the, the, the philosopher's um, vest here that um, survived to the meditation to take over what, what it could be in, in a true Roman sense. Right, he could perceive in certain divides between that and uh, Eastern, let's say, philosophical take and what were the, were the duties of Romanity in a sense. Uh, as you've seen, he was very highly educated, so he knew well, let's say, what he was, you know, what it, where he was coming from. Um, and uh, in spite of the transformations of the empire, even culturally, the there's here there is still a fundamentally. Uh, uh, an italic background like so uh, something that is truly latin and western in the in, in the nature of the empires from the third century would fundamentally not be the case right with emperors who were coming from the eastern provinces with actually a very different background even culturally speaking so it's a fascinating figure that we will expand on in next uh, videos and we will hopefully cover satisfactorily in a, uh, at that point in a well comprehensive way for now however we stop it here uh, I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming content and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye